So we're, we're pleased to be back here talking about our work. And today we're going to be talking about bio-inspired fragility and technological advancement. And we're going to do that through talking about four projects. Um, so um, considering fragility of natural systems, um, our obsession with speed and efficiency, um, our use of science and technology to provide um, solutions, um, and the importance for a new vision for bio-inspired systems. Um, so we'll do that through talking about four projects, and like Yannick said, we'll sort of end on our current work, which we're working on with a bio-inspired lab. So Paul and I, um, we live in, we're very privileged because we live uh, near the New Forest. And this is an amazing, diverse habitat. Um, there's so many things on our doorstep, so we're really lucky and we feel very privileged to kind of live in near this national park in the UK. Um, and the habitat consists of um, coastal marshland, bogland, peatland, and heatherland, so it's very diverse. Um, we, we walk a lot in this environment. We try to get out as much as we can away from the screen because we spend a lot of time looking at screens, so it's good to get out into the real world. Um, and occasionally we find surprises and unexpected things whilst we're out walking. So one day we were out with our son walking uh, through a field and we came, ac um, and we came across um, alien squid that appeared to have dropped down from outer space and all kind of buried their heads um, in the ground. It was the most kind of bizarre thing. And we've, I mean, we've, when you've lived somewhere for a very long period, period of time and you suddenly just see something completely new, um, it, it's, it's, it reminds us of the potential or the diversity that we have in nature to constantly throw up, up, up um, surprises. So it kind of transpires that this is a really rare fungus um, known by some as octopus fungus. Um, and it originates in the southern hemisphere, but due to um, global warming, it's starting to crop up in other places. Um, but it's, it's still incredibly rare. Um, We've heard of mycologists, or we've read about mycologists that have, have hoped or waited the whole of their lives just to see one. And we, we saw eight mm. in one day. Um, so for us, it kind of, it signifies two things. It sort of, it, it signif it sort of signifies this, the huge diversity of forms and life that we have in the natural world. And it also reminds us that our environment is changing. Um, and that's something that we're really interested in. So um, the other side to where we live, it's not all beautiful, but you could say this is beautiful in an industrial kind of scale. Um, but on the other side of the New Forest is the lar well, it's Europe's largest petrochemical plant. Um, so we live right on the doorstep of this um, uh, system here and um, what's interesting is it's um, engulfed with uh, trees which basically the, the forest are trying to manage and um, hide this this what some people could see as a monstrosity kind of thing um, but the tallest kind of chimneys do poke out so you do see them and and also when it's lit up at night it almost looks like a metropolis it's it's on a huge scale um, and another thing that's quite interesting about this is that they do uh, guided tours unfortunately we haven't had the chance to do one of these tours but um, it's, it's kind of you, you get your tea and biscuits and you can kind of go on this bus tour so it's so big that you have to get on a bus to kind of traverse this um, this site so it's odd if you're if you're a visitor and you go onto the visitors website um, considering how significant oil is um, in, con in, in con contemporary culture it's surprising that this isn't on the front page. Not only that, if you actually kind of, if you search with the keywords oil and refinery, it still doesn't come up on your things to do shortlist. 
Um, so it's something that seems to suggest that our sensibilities towards technology and our sensibilities towards the natural world seem at odds. Um, and I suppose in some ways that's something that we kind of try and explore in our work. We're very kind of in, you know, we're very interested in the mechanics of the natural world, um, but we explore those through um, using or through, through an artistic practice that focuses on contemporary tech technologies. Okay, so we're going to talk now about one of our projects that we did in 2010. So like Paul said, we're very much inspired by the mechanics of the natural world. Um, everything we produce runs in real time, but we're interested in the diversity of the natural world, but not only the diversity, but the loss of diversity as well. So this piece of work is called Lost Calls of Cloud Mountain Whirly Gigs. Um, the Whirly Gigs are kind of flying bots, so they're the agents in it, and they live in this virtual environment, so they live at the top of this um, craggy mountain um, scape. And what's interesting about this work is obviously because it runs in real time. Um, you know, this, this work does actually live in public collections and it also lives in people's homes as well. So they spend a lot of time with this work. So it kind of shifts over time and they experience a diversity that you need to kind of spend time with as well. So in many ways, it kind of shares a lot in common with um, scientific representations. So the way that we work, we're kind of interested in um, an idea of systems, um, the, the kind of relationships between things, behaviors, um, and interactions. So it shares a lot in common with um, the way that scientists might create models or representations to understand the world. But we're kind of just interested in creating expressions that are kind of built on those same principles. So I think I'm going to try and play a little clip of it now. Um, so obviously this will be a screen capture from the work as it runs in real time. Do we have sound? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so um, in this work, we wanted to engage with the idea of natural diversity. So the flying creatures called um, whirly gigs, they, they live for a period of time, and then they discreetly um, uh, come out of view um, where they are removed from the system. So continually, you're having um, new uh, whirly gigs generated, um, and they're replaced. So each family is unique. 
um, and they all have a unique call and an individual call. Um, so we have a big library of parts that they're kind of um, stitched together to create unique forms. And this was something that we were really interested in in regards to that someone that was watching the system might have a completely unique experience. They might be the only person that sees that particular form. Um, so, the, so the system is continually um, shifting and changing over time and presenting something new, just like we're interested in when we go out walking and we find something new. We want people to kind of, viewers to have that sort of experience, that, that, that they're having new experiences every time they see the work. So, um, so we kind of, we wrote the rules for this world. We kind of, um, um, the wedding gigs, they have a simple life cycle. They spend their time flying or singing or resting. Um, and we, we wrote the rules that describe their physical uni, uh, universe. We kind of write, wrote the rules that describe their body mechanics, their morphology. And we wrote the rules that described their, their behavior. Um, but one morning, when we were creating the work, we kind of woke up and we found all the whirly gigs facing west. And this was a kind of a surprise that we weren't expecting. We were interested in this idea of diversity and that work would kind of be constantly generating new forms. And that through that process of generation, there'd be kind of surprises or maybe kind of just interesting kind of behaviors that cropped up. But, um, but this was something that we knew wasn't possible within the rules that we'd created. Um, and we really had that no idea or no clear idea why this was happening. Um, we had, we'd, we'd been, we knew that we'd been concerned about population numbers and resources, that we were working within the limited resources of the system, and we thought there might be kind of certain stress points where we'd have to manage those resources. So we had written in and a kind of a, a behavior where if the system's resources started to run low, some of the worldly gigs would go into a deep hibernation, so they would kind of shut down, free up resources, um, so that the, the other worldly gigs, the other creatures, could still fly around and be active, and we'd always have something to see. But it should have never have happened that they all kind of would shut down at the same time. This was, and, and they, they never woke up. You know, they went into this kind of deep sleep, they all went into this deep sleep and never woke up. So we kind of, you know, we're artists first and programmers second. We kind of make mistakes very frequently. So we thought, okay, this is just a slight kind of error in the code. We'll kind of go through and, and just kind of trace for where, where things are going wrong and, and time passed. We couldn't find the bugs. We started stripping things out and trying to pare the system down to its absolute minimum. And we kind of took away almost everything, but we still had this problem. Um, where they would eventually all shut down, all go into this deep sleep. Um, and eventually we discovered that sort of beyond our control, there was a memory leak in open, 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 in OpenGL. Um, and um, it was sort of something that we, we really hadn't kind of, um, we, we couldn't really kind of work out a way to Resolve. Eventually, we um, we had to just schedule the work to reboot at certain um, uh, time intervals. So the work just kind of shuts down, reboots, that flushes all um, of the the memory, and everything's fine. Um, but it kind of it kind of struck us that this was quite potent in the way that it how we manage kind of our own our resources here on Earth, and that that option to reboot the work um, isn't, really, isn't really viable. Um, so, so kind of, how, do we, how do we manage the limits of the system? Are there any un un unknown leaks? Will these leaks lead to failure? And what's the, the solution? That's something that's kind of, it's fine for us to consider in terms of the creation of a, as a simulated artwork, but um, not, so, not so great when we start to apply that out elsewhere. So it, kind of, it, made, it made it very apparent to us the difference between um, 
worked within simulation from a, 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 a point of artistic expression, and it started, we started to question the use of simulation um, in scientific contexts. Mm. So, oh, okay, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm quite um, happy to yeah. talk about So, um, in terms of our use of, it, of, of, of resources, we know we like to get the most out, 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 of, um, out of a system. So, we're kind of make, going to make a little switch now. So, um, and just think about a bit about technology. Um, okay, so, technology. One of the things that I get a little bit excited about is... Um, something that's quite unremarkable, um, and it's the first kind of transatlantic um, communication between, um, if we take London to n New York, and the idea that at some point in history, someone decided it would be a good idea to stretch a wire across, across the Atlantic Ocean. And it's one of those things, it sounds quite simple, um, but when you fly over the Atlantic Ocean and you realize how big it is, just that idea that someone would think, let's take a wire and stretch it across the... It's, I, how do you do that? Even now, I have no... You know, it seems unimaginably complex to stretch a wire um, across the ocean. Um, but 18, 1855, yeah, 1855, I think, 1855, yeah. um, for the first time, we had... Um, an electronic connection, a transcontinental electronic um, uh, connection. Before then, it would have taken 10 days to send a communication from London to New York. When the wire was installed, that was slashed to 17 hours. The first communication that was sent only took 17 hours. That's that's somewhere in the region of a 93% speeding increase. It's a phenomenal increase. I mean, of course, you'd imagine at that point, everyone would have been so excited that you, know, you, you, you would have left it there. We, 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 we would have been happy. But um, being human, and especially being engineers, someone thought, well, OK, maybe if we just kind of crank up the voltage uh, we might be able to kind of speed things up. There's lots of errors, and they had to kind of keep um, cross-checking those, um, those errors to um, make sure that the message was correct. So they thought, we'd just crank up, up the voltage, and we'd increase the speed of communication. So they cranked up the voltage, and they burnt out the wire. And when you think, <laughs> when you, think I, I, you know, how hard that must have been, how to, to stretch a wire across there, the idea that within a month, of achieving that feat, the desire just to go that little bit faster resulted in the wire being burnt out. Um, but of course, we know, we, know, we know the story ends well. <laughs> um, so we're looking at um, 10 years later. So I think it was 1866, they laid another cable. Um, and that was like 50 times faster than that initial cable. And like obviously now, as we all know, we're living in the fiber optic world and everything's great. Everything's running at light speed um, communication. And uh, that's all wonderful, um, which is great. And if we, were, if we send an email from London to New York, it now takes 0.0286 of a second, um, which is, you know, we can't get any faster, can we? That's the problem. We kind of reach the limit of how fast we can go. We're now at light speed communication speed, and we cannot go any faster. So in 2008, Paul and I asked ourselves, is there space in our speed-obsessed world for a service that takes time? And um, we devised this project, which is the world's first webmail service to use um, real snails. Um, so the snails are equipped with um, RFID um, tags. And um, I mean, the thing about this system, what we're interested in is real snail mail is not only slow, but it's fragile, imperfect, unreliable, um, more human than machine by kind of like giving it a biological interface. 
We, we only asked users. Oh, yes, yeah, so, so here we can see the snail paradise that we uh, created. Um, and we had a terms of use like any email provider. I mean, we really kind of, only did, I mean, the, only, the only difference from Hotmail, for, for example, uh, or any other kind of webmail service was that in our terms of use, we just asked that the users consider that a, sign a significant amount of time would elapse between the sending and the receiving of their communications. Which is which a, currently around seven years. So that's um, kind of quite, quite significant. Yeah. <laughs> and that in that period, that things might change. Um, it seems, I mean, since the service has been running, it seems that um, two things. One, people like, there's some, obviously there's something about snails that brings out people's romantic side. They seem to generally send romantic communications. There's obviously something about slowness and romance that seems to um, come together. Also, the, the service runs just below the speed of human relationships, so that often by the time they, a sender finds out that their message is just about to be delivered, they're no longer in a relationship with the person that they've just, that they, they, the seven years ago they de declared their everlasting love for. Um, so it was one of those kind of interesting things where, where the use of technology suddenly kind of made us realize that we, we have different ideas about um, speed and um, ef um, efficiency when it kind of, when we, um, when we challenge those, those paradigms that um, are normally centered on a, on, a, on a more economic and industrial way of thinking. So the snails are um, equipped with RFID tags and they have to move in the enclosure um, 50 centimetres to pick up a, a collect an email from the RFID interrogator before they actually go another 50 centimetres to actually dispatch the, um, the message. And for us, this project, I mean, it's been a long-term project, um, it's a different vision for technology than the one favored by current economic paradigms. It's, it's trying to kind of shift those. Obviously, normally RFID technology is used for speed and efficiency. We were interested in kind of shifting that paradigm and using it in a completely different way. But this makes us question, um, is it more or less ridiculous, you know, the way that we're using this technology? Um, so if we go right back to kind of the Industrial Revolution and uh, Robert Owen, you've probably come across this, um, this phrase before, this slogan, actually devised this slogan. He was um, working in a mill in Manchester in the UK, so he was very kind of hands-on in that period. Um, he was also a social reformer and he coined this um, slogan, eight hours labor, eight hours recreation, eight hours rest so I mean here we are in a kind of an ex-industrial um, unit I, 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 um, I suppose um, and I mean since then we've had a significant effort placed on the idea of kind of or that comes from those kind of industrial origins, the idea of productivity and time efficiency, time saving. Um, we've had a huge kind of effort invested in creating technological solutions to what we might consider as a time poverty, you know, that we, we um, have had 200 years of creating technological um, solutions to our time poverty, but we still, um, but we still feel time poor. Um, and also, it's interesting when we think of the idea of kind of in, um, industry and where that's led kind of humanity, where we have this um, a huge wealth of stuff. Um, so we kind of we feel very wealthy, but when we consider the the meaning and the origins of the word wealth, it kind of comes from a, from an abundance of resources or in, in, an abundance that exists in our environment. So the wealth that we have has really kind of come at a cost, and the cost is the wealth of those natural resources that we have. And the the origins of the word wealth 
stem from an idea of health. So it's led us to a state where the planet is kind of, the health of the planet is suffering. So it's one of those kind of contradictions that the wealth that we have is at the expense of the wealth um, in every other sense of, of the word. Um, and we still, our working week is still based around this principle of eight hours labor, eight hours recreation, and eight hours rest. That's still the basis of working week. So what we've had 200 years, 200 years of time-saving technology, and we're still working a full working week. Um, so there's still this kind of this necessity, this need to come up with time-saving um, inventions, and still a huge amount of effort. Um, so we introduce hopefully, the poop trap. Um, so this isn't a conceptual artwork. This is actually a genuine product that um, helps people to save time. Um, and it, uh, apparently is environmentally friendly. If anyone could explain to me exactly how <laughs> this is in, 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 in environmentally friendly, please do. Um, it comes in two versions. There's one that's slightly more expensive that uses magnets. The cheaper version uses Velcro. Um, I think there's an obvious kind of flaw in that design, mm. um, especially when we focus on time uh, uh, um, efficiency. <laughs> like most devices that save time, they save time until the point where you have to clean them. Um, but it kind of makes us think about um, the, the absurdity of the world that we living and the absurdity of real snail mail that there, there were people that um mm. that were really kind of yeah some people sort of responded said that, very well yeah and there was other people that sort of said oh what a waste of time like yeah, kind of, the, the, people must have too much time on their hands which is interesting but we feel we kind of felt imagine the world how the world would be if every time someone ordered some crappy in invention, it took seven years to place that order, um, <laughs> maybe they'd have time to think. Um, so, um, historian Edward Tenner, in a TED talk, he kind of talks about the different. Uh, he talks about um, unintended consequences, and he describes this kind of this human kind of um, capacity to come up with incredibly ingenious solutions, and yet, and we have this kind of increasing capability to come up with technologically advanced, um, very clever solutions, but we have a constant um, a constant ability of foresight, so that why our ability to come up with these solutions is increasing, our understanding of how those solutions play out in the longer term remains, remains constant. At the end of his talk, he, um, he kind of gives this image of the, the, or this idea that those unintended consequences are a powerful catalyst for progress. So his arg argument is every time we come up with the solution, to a problem, we create, we solve one problem and create two more. And that through that kind of escalating kind of chain reaction, that that's a, that's a fantastic kind of thing that helps us drive progress, that it means that we have to come up with more solutions, and that's, um, that's the kind of driving mechanism be behind technolo technological advancement. Um, fantastic, sounds very positive. Um, f I mean, for us, we kind of think of it as more of a kind of a, a scary runaway reaction. Um, I suppose which brings us to the next section um, in that we, we don't always get what we expect. And I think one of the things that really kind of highlights this, I mean, I'm sure that we've all had maybe some toast or a sandwich in the last couple of days and it's had margarine on it, or maybe we like peanut butter. I know I like peanut butter, but I find it really hard to find some without palm oil in. Um, and like Paul said, we don't always get what we expect. 
And I think this kind of highlights it at the moment. This is um, in Malaysia, and it is in northern Malaysia this shot's been taken from. And obviously we see here um, aggressive deforestation um, for making space for palm oil plantations. Um, so we're seeing these kind of economic forces and the impact that they're having on our landscape. Um, maybe directly, we, they're not impacting us because we don't live in Malaysia, but we're seeing these images quite frequently kind of popping up. Um, this is rapidly happening. This is like happening at a speed that is uncontrollable. Um, and this, this rapid change is leading to new diseases that are jumping from animals to human species. Um, so the effect that we're having on our uh, climate is having huge effects on human populations. So in 2014, we were lucky enough to partner with someone to work on a project uh, looking at um, a zoonotic infection. So he was part of a project called the Monkey Bar Project. And basically, they're looking at um, land use change and how human and um, macaques are kind of interacting in um, the northern point of Malaysia. Malaysia. So, um, okay, yeah, so recently kind of reports have emerged from um, Malaysia of a, of a new form of malaria. There's a form of malaria called Plasmodium nolzai. Um, it was previously thought to only affect long-tailed and pig-tailed macaques um, and started showing up in the human population. So um, for a while it was misdiagnosed because just based on kind of um, visual kind of confirmation of the parasite through a microscope, it looks very similar to a, a quite a benign form of human malaria. But people were dying, so someone got suspicious and did some genetic analysis, and they discovered that this form of malaria that should only exist in um, monkeys was turning up in the human population. Um, and so they started to kind of um, get quite concerned about this because Plasmodium nosei has a rapid 24-hour replication cycle in humans and it often leads to death from severe malaria. Um, so um, they started to look at how, what may have changed that was leading to this, um, this, this disease making the leap from monkeys to humans. And one of the things that the focus centered on was that this kind of aggressive land use change, um, quite pro often driven by things like palm oil plantation, was for forcing a lot of local kind of populations to have to grow their own food. They were losing lots of their existing farmland. Um, in that, in that process, they would cut down areas of forest, dis, displace the macaque population, and, um, and then plant their crops. When their crops bared fruit, the macaques would come back and raid those crops. Obviously, everyone likes to feed their children, so they weren't happy about the macaques ra raiding their crops. And in the centre, we see this kind of sleeping platform, and farmers were sleeping in the fields to try and defend their crops, and which kind of brought them in direct contact with the macaques at prime blood feeding, blood feeding time. Um, and one of the things that the kind of research is really kind of trying to understand is to what extent um, what the mechanism for spillover is, um, and also to what extent it's still not fully understood whether there's human to human communication, because that's the point at which we have a serious, mm -hmm. seri serious problem. Um, but it was really interesting for us because um, I don't know where we're going with the slides. Can we, yeah, can we I'm see? Just talk okay, about should, should we just today? show yeah. a little clip? Or? Yeah, so we actually show, we did two versions of this work. So we did a, a film version and there's a real time version that runs in a game engine. So we're just going to, we won't probably play the whole of the film version, but we'll play a bit now so you can get a feel of. Um, how it looks. So the film version takes you through the scenario, so you see much more of the scenario. Um, let me just... 
So working with the, I'll, I'll just kind of talk over it because I'm okay. sure we're, yeah. we're not always good at keeping time, are we? <laughs> um, so working with the scientists, we, um, we had this interest in, um, we had this interest in the idea of a scientific truth and how that is different from an artistic um, expression. Um, and we wanted to sort of try and explore the potential for creating a representation of these that had a truth that related to a scientific un um, understanding or had an, a kind of a strong link to um, the scientific way of thinking and working, um, but maintained the kind of principles of an aesthetic um, expression. So we work with a scientist called uh, Dr. Paddy Brock, who's a mathematical modeler. So he was looking at these trans transmission scenarios through um, models of, uh, so they do a SEI model, which stands for Susceptible, Exposed, Infected, Recovered. So they look at the transmission scenario on population numbers within those sort of areas. What was interesting when we started to talk to Paddy was that we had quite a common language and the language that we could start communicating with him about was the landscape how because they're starting to very recently epidemiology has started to look at spatial kind of distributions of the transmission scenarios um, so we could kind of start to kind of think about that space through landscape so Paddy was primarily doing his research on the Bangi Island which is one of the islands on the north uh, tip of um, Malaysia, which gave us a space to kind of focus the, the model on. So, I mean, what we see kind of conforms to the uh, to many kind of conventions in the moving image, but it's fundamentally what we're viewing is a model or a simulation of an infection transmission scenario. Um, and one of the things that's that, that um, was really interesting is that epidemiology, epidemiology has reached this point where they're starting to understand the limitations of the representations that they're currently working to and that there's a, an increased desire to try and engage with some of the spatial qualities that are so significant in the way diseases are transmitted. So I don't know if the next slide in the presentation okay. is an Ebola model. Yeah, we could probably talk about that then. But so we took... Um, scientific maps that they're using um, to actually shape this this piece so we looked at kind of forest cover and where there was water sources and things so but we wanted to um, represent it from the mosquitoes perspective so each kind of spiral is um, evocative of a mosquito flight path video version of the work which we've capt captured from the real-time engine so the actual real-time engine um, follows that the macaques are invisible but it will follow um, the macaques that move in in that game engine and the uh, mosquito trails are in the wake of the the macaques so, so, so it's I mean it's programmed to try and it takes lots of years from the epidemiology but we built the simulation in a game engine, so it's kind of combining those two ways of thinking. I mean, at points, you do get a perspective in the game engine, like you just saw there. There was like a top-down perspective, which is much more usual within a scientific visualisation. Um, but very much in the game engine, it's like a first-person sort of perspective. And there's very little research that's been done into mosquito movement as well, so it gave us quite a lot of artistic licence in regards to representing that. So, um, okay, so I think we're just going to talk a little bit about Paddy's model. So, yeah. uh, obviously, we worked with Paddy for about two years on this, so it was quite a long kind of project for us. 
Um, and in that time, Paddy would, would send us some of his models. So this is one of his um, models that he's done in, he used a programming language called R Projects. Um, projects. This is um, an Ebola, this is based on Ebola um, transmission. And one of the things that really kind of dawned on us is that um, they represent, you know, huge numbers of what well, de decrease decreasing populations just by one single line. And we were like, how can you represent these billions, you know, thousands of people just through one um, single line? Um, so, also, the models are just seem to be um, incredibly abstract. For example, when you look at the code, individuals don't exist. There's, no, there's nothing in the code that describes the presence of an e individual. There's nothing in the, in the representation in terms of its code that um, has any idea of space at all. They're kind of really, really kind of really abstract representations. So they're still based on a similar process of understanding the life cycle, understanding the mechanics of the, of the system, but they're reduced to a simplicity mm. that we found incredibly bizarre. And I think in epidemiology, epidemiology there's a kind of a shared understanding that those, that way of thinking is limited and flawed. And there's a huge desire to try and understand how to engage with greater levels of complexity. But they make them so that they can be unpicked, don't they? So they're so simple that they can be unpicked, but they're quite generalizable as well, so they can be applied to lots of different situations. But was, what was quite interesting with us working with Paddy is we, we both, we kind of realized that we were both creating fictional landscapes. He was kind of creating fictional ones through these simple kind of models, but also we're creating fictional landscapes in the way that we're representing this dangerous disease. So there's this idea that we have culturally that kind of art is all about fictions and fantasies and science is all about truth and reality and really understanding the mechanics of the world. And what was really kind of apparent is that that way of thinking just is it's completely wrong. Um, and, um, and, and it's kind of, it affects the way we kind of think and interact with the planet. So this way of kind of representing um, or reducing the systems to these really kind of simplified ways of thinking results in management strategies that are also kind of oversimplified. In terms of kind of human macaque interactions, most management strategies are based on managing macaque populations, which just means really getting rid of the macaques, then you get rid of the transmission and you get rid of the problem. So it's a kind of a reductionist approach that's to do with kind of just taking components out of that system and increasing the simplicity of of the, of the system. And also in agriculture, we have a kind of a similar kind of reductionist way of thinking where agriculture seems to face, um, favor monocultures, mm. which um, starts to introduce um, incredible vulnerabilities. Um, so this made us sort of think about how um, science alone is incompatible with the challenges we face. And, and very much so in Afterglow, we wanted to kind of show that complex, complexity, that, that kind of extent and volume of the mosquitoes. So you had a feeling that when it builds up over time that you can actually see the complexity of that as a system and you know, like how it sort of engulfs you. So almost like it's like a blizzard as you're, as you're going through the transmission scenario. But very much isn't something that can be unpicked mm. or understood. So we've done a lot of questioning through this project and one of the questions is what is an accurate representation of a disease transmission? And, and we have presented alongside our scientists and you know he's, he's heard our interpretation of it. Um, I have a quote from him here where he talks about this sort of representation, this scientific representation. So he says, scientists try as hard as possible to make their mathematical models as close to reality as possible. But how often are they prevented from doing so by constraints of the model setup or limitations of computer power? And is the distance that these uncontrollable constraints take the model away from a true representation of the real world further than a dis from the distance an artistic perspective would. 
So I suppose fundamentally there was one thing that we kind of, one point on which we kind of firmly agreed is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and it's our, I suppose it's our feeling that for a kind of a healthy human culture that we have to have that broader perspective. We need to widen the frame. We can't put all of our emphasis on, on, on a way of thinking that is fundamentally reductionist and creates this belief that it, everything's going to be okay because we'll, we'll come up with a robust solution. Um, one of the things that I think is really apparent when you kind of take the longer view is that there is no robust so solution. And that kind of brings us to the final project where we've been working with, um, working with an, in an artificial life lab with um, biologists who are creating control systems for robots. So this is where we kind of get to this idea of bio-inspired engineering. And it was really interesting. I mean, this is still quite a new project, and we're still very much working on it, so it's a current project. But we were really lucky to spend some time with um, the scientists and with the biologists um, in Graz last year um, who are working on the, the kind of this system. So um, it's, it's a FET project, so it's a future emerging technology project. There's a lot of consortium members that are working on it. I think there's nine consortium members that are working on it. And what they're trying to do is devise a, well, I hope, they're hoping it's the, one of the largest swarms, aren't they? Underwater swarms um, in a very highly um, human um, impact area. They're actually um, going to be putting these in the Venice Lagoon. They've been testing them in the Venice Lagoon. So it's a three-tier kind of robotic system. So you have the, the A-pads that float on the surface of the water, which have solar panels, and they're the ones that actually communicate with the scientists. So they take the data and then transmit that to the scientists. And they're like the charging kind of docks. They have the middle tier system, which is the A-fish um, system, which actually communicate with these muscles. So they call these ones the A-muscles that actually sit on the, the floor bed that actually are the ones that are collecting the, the data. And this is a self-directed learning system. So they're, they're, the way that the lab is working on it is like a colony of um, A-muscles that are going to pass on their data to the next colony of A mussels. And then the A fish um, trans take that data from the A mussels and bring it up to the, the A pad. So the only ones that are mobile um, are the A fish that are actually transmitting the, the information. Um, so we spent quite, well, we went to the lab, we went to the A-Life lab at the Carl Franzen University in um, Graz last year, and it was really interesting to hear about how, well, they actually have physical beehives there, so they're looking at swarm intelligence, A-Life swarm intelligence, but actually starting from from looking at the honeybees and how and tracking their movements. So um, the work is, I mean, primarily these are biologists that are trying to understand the mechanics of the natural world um, and then apply them in an engineering context. So that it all starts with observations like attaching, it can be as simple as attaching numbers to the bees and kind of um, observing their movements using some quite, sometimes using some quite advanced computer um, vision tech technologies and then trying to kind of reverse engineer systems based on those ob observations. And one of the systems that they came up with was a system called b -clust. Um, which is based on rules so simple that they can be described in a, in, in a single sentence. It's just if you have agents moving around, when they bump into each other, they stop for a period of time that increases the happier they are. So that allows the swarm as a whole to locate and identify favorable locations in their environment. Um, and, and, and their focus is to take this, take this understanding from the natural world and then apply it in an engineering, engineering context. 
Um, so we kind of got to spend some time in the lab with an electrical engineer, which was great, apart from electrical engineers are obsessed with um, data sheets and specifications. I mean, we wasn't there for that long, and we ended up having to try and convince them that how about we just throw it in the tank and see what happens, um, which electrical engineers find that incredibly alarming. But <laughs> after a while, after a while, they kind of got into it, um, and we developed this more spontaneous way of working. But we, we was, all the time, we was trying trying to understand um, what the relationship was between um, what was going on in the lab and this kind of wider concern that we have for the relationship between technology and sort of broad, more broader environmental concerns. And if there was anything that, um, um, anything that we could take from the world of bio-inspired engineering that would, um, that would help liberate technology from the paradigms of the industrial, or from, of, or from the origins of um, the industrial era, era. If there's a new vision that we could, that we could end up with, and it kind of um, one of the things that happened was that we started to understand that although their solutions, although the robots they were building were very kind of sophisticated and they would end up as very well-engineered machines, a lot of the stuff they were doing was starting its life as kind of simple experiments with um, jam jars and plastic waste. And we started to kind of mi mirror that process and create our own robots from um, um, plastic waste and microcontrollers yeah. trying to understand are we start we thinking about what, what are the motion dynamics of plastic of motion controlled plastic waste um, we, this was quite a challenge for us because we haven't dealt with robotics physical robotics in our work before and i think in fact it was it felt really slow didn't it because we kept on thinking like we could you know just create a simulation and be much quicker to kind of simulate this but one of the things that we kind of I mean, I suppose working, we normally work in simulation, so obviously the physics in the system, we can kind of change it, whereas working with physical robotics, you know, we couldn't do that, you know, and, that, and so things do take longer and, you know, that we, there was limitations with that. One of the things was um, the robots that we had had these kind of plastic tendrils and they would strangle themselves. And in the lab, the engineers were going, OK, OK, we have a problem. Don't worry, we'll find a, a um, solution. And for us, it seemed to be quite interesting, this idea of the robots made from plastic waste, you know, struggling with their own kind of detritus that they would, they would self-harm self and, and kind of kill themselves. Um, we started to become um, interested in, in this uh, um, embodied idea of these robots kind of suffering in their own environment from their own waste and had an idea of um, robots in in distress we um, and we started to kind of wonder what how the robots would how we could create robots that would have this more fragile existence or this more fragile um, relationship what would they do um, if they were stressed or distressed in their environment. But also, and how are they relevant in an increasingly destabilized world as well? So, um, another thing that the lab is working on is an idea of emotional robotics. Um, oh, which I forgot. Yeah. So, the other thing is... Um, Actually, I'll, sh I'll play yeah, some yeah. video okay. quickly, then you can actually see it, one of them in action. I think I've got, so it must be that one there. really interesting because something that you get with working physically as well is, is it's very evocative and it's very beautiful and it would be actually quite hard it would be very hard to kind of simulate this so we're almost getting something for free in a way. but it was interesting how they had although they were incredibly simple they had this um they had this sort of biological signature which also was quite evocative of the idea of um, or reminded us of the confusion that much marine life faces um, when it kind of comes across plastic waste um, 
And there's been an Australian study where 90% um, were in this study, which was quite recent, it was about two years old, 90% of seabirds are found to have plastic waste in their um, inside. So it's, it's quite a significant portion of seabirds that are consuming plastic waste. Um, and, you know, it's made us realize through the project and the, and the questioning that we're doing through the project is that humans seem unable to change this behavior towards plastic. And, and it's making us realize through the projects that we've also, the other uh, projects previously, how system, systems have started to fail. Um, and, like, and like you said earlier, it's a bit hard to reboot the world, yeah. isn't it? So we started to kind of think about this kind of idea of a systems failure and then something else that was going on in the lab was this thing that related to an idea of emotional ro um, robotics or the idea that that could be used to create a robust solution or that, or the, 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 or this kind of this idea of the bio-inspired was about engineering and creating solutions. We were shown this simulation um, of a emotional Brattenburg vehicle. I, I don't know if anyone's kind of experienced in the really kind of simple vehicles that have kind of like, often they kind of exist as children toys where you have these two light sensors, um, two motors and some wiring and you shine a torch and they kind of turn towards the torch. It's something known as a, Brat um, a Brattenburg vehicle. Um, and it's a very kind of simple sort of idea of artificial life. Um, and they were creating um, simulations of these vehicles where they have two sensors, two wheels, and two synapses con um, um, connecting them. And what they had what they had done in the lab is they just introduced this third mechanism, which was a kind of an a simulated hormone, so that there'd be a feedback cycle in those vehicles. And then they'd created this simulation where they had resources in an environment filled with these vehicles. And the ones with hormones, um, which was the way they kind of were consi was considering the use of a, um, an idea of emotions, our emotions are very much kind of related to hormones. The vehicles that had hormones would outperform the vehicles without hormones in their efficiency and the speed at which they could rush around consuming resources. And we were shown this kind of simulation of these little kind of agents whizzing around, rapidly kind of eating everything that they came across with, um, with, 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 um, impressive efficiency um, like this this was a brilliant um, a brilliant thing um, I think it's fair to say that um, our vision for um, emotional robotics I think is slightly different than um, um, one that relates to ideas of efficiency and consumption of resources so we've been working on a simulation where we're using exactly the same principles, um, where we have these simple agents that um, have a very s um, limited motion capacity. All they can do is propel themselves upwards. They have a very limited communication system where they kind of com com communicate with other agents and they're just aware of other agents in their area. And they... Um, respond to each other and try and adjust their position based on the feedback they get from their other agents. Um, and we're using this same mechanism of um, um, built around uh, artificial hormones, um, but not to create them, not to create more efficient agents, but we're trying to train our, our agents to recognize when they lose agency. So we're trying to get them to recognize when they can't, when they can no longer perform their tasks. They have to maintain a certain energy level. And if they reach a point where their energy, energy level is no longer um, allowing them to um, effectively move around, they lose agency. And the ones that successfully recognize that they've failed or they're failing um, are, the ones that, are the ones that we prize and the ones that we value and the ones that we keep in that, in that system. So um, we're trying to create robots that recognize failure, that can develop, can evolve a sense of despondency that they can, that they can give up. Um, and 
Um, also, the system has this massive flaw in that it's absolutely impossible to tell the difference between an agent that has successfully recognised that it's fouled and one that just believes that it, it's, it, it, it's, it's fouled. So they're kind of also maybe suffering from depression um, <laughs> as well. But um, we, we feel that there's a kind of a, an importance to recognise the fragility, that we're trying to take an idea of the bio-inspired to understand that humans aren't very good at coming up with ro robust solutions, but we're very good at coming up with failures. Um, that, that through that, that we can foster a, a, a sensitivity towards a natural environment that's also incredibly vulnerable. So that's, where we, so that's where we are now, and, and we're continuing through um, our projects to collaborate with um, other science institutions to um, kind of combine a deeper kind of cultural interaction um, and provide valuable societal tools to deal with complex problems. And. Um, if you want to find out any more about boredom research, we're on most social networks, so you can find out about us. All right, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. It was very interesting. So no, are there any questions? Come on. Obviously, we covered everything. Sorry? <laughs> Obviously, we covered everything. Yeah, so maybe, well. maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Future projects. Yeah? The next project. Yeah. What's the next project? Okay. Um, I mean, we've worked, there's obviously a lot of projects here that we haven't shown you as well. So we've been working on another project, um, which is a digital loom. So it's based on the Jacquard loom. Um, and it's also based on um, some research into freshwater pearl mussels, which are one of the longest living invertebrates. They can live up to 250 years. Um, so we've been very inspired by their form and we've been creating biological creatures to ultimately create, because um, they're based on the Paisley pattern as well, because it was a Scottish Commission project. Um, and we're um, generating a system to ultimately create 7.4 billion forms, isn't it? So that, so that every kind of human alive on Earth can have their own kind of paisley pattern biological form um, so we're hoping to kind of develop that because that's very much being quite a it's an installation piece so it's quite sculptural so we want to develop that into an online project as well so that we'll make it so we can distribute it um, a lot wider so currently the work exists, it, it's a kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a recreation of the loom, so we're kind of interested in the text, or an idea of industry. So we have a loom that rather than create, ma mass produce the same, um, the same object, it creates diversity and it creates a unique form for every human alive on earth. So we're trying to kind of um, flip some ideas or ways of thinking about technology and that technology isn't really about um, ex those kind of existing traditional paradigms of mass production, but it's about kind of creativity and diversity. And there's a really interesting story because when we think of the weaving loom, we think about mass production, but it was not only the first kind of um, programmable machine, but in that form, it was the first time that a programmable machine was used for creative purposes. So the, when the artist came up with a design, the loom operators would thread up the loom with different colored threads and they would produce different variations of that, of that design. So they were using this idea of a programmable machine to explore the a parameter space and the like. What kind of, what diversity of forms can we create um, from this pattern, so you have a kind of an input, a mechanism, and um, a, a, a space of potential and, poss and possibilities. So that idea of creativity and possibility and creative potential was right there at the history of, of um, programming. But some, but in many, it sort of it seemed to get lost for quite a long period of time. Um, and I think it, you know. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. that's something that I, I think should be very much kind of significant in our vision of the future. But also the, the scientist that we're working with on the project is she's doing some really interesting studies as well because she's based at Glasgow University and because um, these freshwater pearl mussels um, they filter up to 50 litres of water a week so they're, they're really important for the ecosystem and they're found in obviously rivers the they're found quite they're quite prevalent aren't they in rivers in Scotland but obviously they're critically endangered because they're actually farmed for their uh, people were legally harvesting them for their pearls so the freshwater pearls um, and then they just sort of pull them out and then if they don't have a pearl in them they just sort of discard them so sometimes you find shells alongside the river but the scientist that we're working with on that project she's doing a really interesting study on um, distress of these mussels because obviously they're monitoring their movement and um, they do actually cluster around dams but they're kind of monitoring whether there's any distress in regards to um, human impact on their environment which is really interesting because it was a completely separate project that we were working on before we started working with the subcultron lab and obviously they've named their their robots on the, the bed um, after mussels and they've kind of been looking at um, mussels but in quite a broad context so with the scientists in Glasgow we can start to look at some of the ways that they're tracking because they're video tracking those mussels and actually think about how that relates to our robots in distress so I, I do see this project as being like a body of work it's almost like just the start of something that we're going to further develop um, I mean it's quite interesting because we'd love to kind of um, exhibit the robots that we're building out of plastic waste but it's quite interesting when we were talking to um, the scientists they, they sort of devise the whole project around longevity. So they're sort of saying, okay, this is like a longevity swarm system. And we were like, well, how long is like long to you guys? And they were sort of like a week. And we were like, okay, so we've got to come up with something here and like work out charging kind of stations. <laughs> and so the logistics of it are quite a lot. But I think ultimately we would like to create our own swarm, wouldn't we? <laughs> so it'd be nice to carry, we're hoping that we can carry on working with, with the, um, the swarm lab in, in Graz and then develop some other projects with them. Everyone wants a drink, I think. <laughs> Question around here. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. All right, thank you.